let's get started. Really appreciate people spending uh, Monday and August talking about primary uh, care. It's a really important topic for not only people, but to a lot of people who are going to be watching um, at home. As you know, we're committed, and President Obama is committed to enacting health insurance reform this year that will both reduce costs and cost growth and generate an improvement in clinical quality and preserve and expand choice. So primary care is really important component in trying to do all of those things. Right now, we all know that high costs make it really difficult for patients to afford uh, adequate insurance and comply with treatment recommendations. And there's one thing we know for sure, it's that quality is uneven across our system. Um, and we need to do something about that because too many patients don't receive the recommended care. So our goal uh, and the thing that many of you have been working towards in Vermont, good to see you again, Craig, uh, and other places around the country is to try to improve that and address these challenges, which we want to do by working with not only with Congress, but also with all of you, uh, including physicians and state health leaders who have already been engaged in some of these reforms. This is going to require changing the way that we deliver health care. And so we're really gratified that some of you have already been engaged in that difficult work. We need to focus on improving the quality of outcomes, uh, making sure that we're providing preventive care and better coordinating care for patients with chronic diseases. And all of those are, are things that primary care has a critical role to play in doing and in driving the kind of transformation of our delivery system that we know we need. So today we've gathered uh, some of the experts in the field and some of you who have been working uh, to do this around the country to discuss some advanced models of primary care that can meet the challenges that confront our health care system. We believe that the reform that we're talking about offers a major opportunity to improve the quality and coordination of care, leading to improved patient health and experience, but also lowering costs. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what some of you have to say about your experience in doing that. We're joined by healthcare leaders who have been developing advanced models of primary care that address these challenges. We have representatives here from state Medicaid programs, from health plans, integrated delivery systems, and physician societies. We're also joined by academic experts, and we appreciate your willingness to come and share your perspectives and expertise on how we can improve and expand these pri advanced primary care models. So we have people here from all over the country and uh, people who have traveled a long way, and we really appreciate your taking the time to do that. I'm also joined today by several colleagues who are working on our administration team in support of reform. Um, and we'll, I think, maybe start off by just going around the room and introducing ourselves, and then Bob Kocher, Dr. Kocher, will have a, uh, some remarks. So Kavita, why don't you start? Sure. Hi. Thank you. My name is Kavita Patel. I'm a policy advisor for Valerie Jarrett, who works overseeing the Office of Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs and a primary care physician by training. And I should have said, I'm Nancy Ann DeParle, the, the director of the White House Office of Health Reform. Mina? I'm Mina Seishamani. I'm the director of policy analysis in the Office of Health Reform at Health and Human Services. And uh, I'm an otolaryngologist by training. Hi, I'm Barbara Smith. I'm special counsel in the Office of Health Reform at HHS and an attorney by training. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Polino. I'm IBM's general manager for our global health care and life sciences responsibility. Hey everyone, I'm Dan Fields. I work at the National Economic Council on Health Care and Innovation Policy. I'm Bob Phillips. I'm the director of the Robert Graham Center and a family physician, part of the American Academy of Family Physicians. <clears throat> I'm John Blum with CMS, and I'm the policy director for the Medicare program. I'm uh, Ken Thorpe. I'm professor of health policy at uh, Emory University and also the executive director of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease. I'm Susan Schur. I'm Chief of Staff to the First Lady. Um, I'm also part of the health care reform team from the White House Counsel's Office. My name is Elizabeth Leshen, and I work on the National Economic Council on Health Care Policy. Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Grumbach. I'm a family doctor, and I chair the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Duggan. I'm a senior economist at the Council of Economic Advisors working on health care policy. I'm Phyllis Torta. I'm Senior Executive for Strategic Initiatives at the National Committee for Quality Assurance. I'm Paul Grundy. I'm the Director of Healthcare Transformation for the IBM Corporation and the President of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, which is an umbrella organization representing 
about 400,000 physicians uh, in primary care and most of the Fortune 500 to really drive transformation or changing the covenant in the way we buy care and deliver care around a model of care, patient-centered primary care. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm John Tucker. I'm the CEO of the American College of Physicians and an internist. Hi, I'm Chris Burge. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Public Hospitals and Health Systems, and for the purpose of this meeting, we'll emphasize the health systems part. Hi, I'm Allie Needleman. I work in the Office of Health Reform. Hi, I'm Rick Gilfillan. I'm a family practitioner by background. Previously, I was the uh, CEO at Geisner Health, and currently acting as a consultant to Geisner. Craig Jones. I'm the Director for the Vermont Blueprint for Health uh, and a pediatrician and, uh, as well. And I'm Michael Solman. I'm a family physician who practiced for 17 years at Group Health before taking on new roles, running primary care for a number of years. Now I'm the president of the medical group and the medical director of the owned and operated delivery system at Group Health. Hi, Barbara Walters, senior medical director at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. I'm the principal investigator for the CMS PGP group practice demonstration project. And here today with Dick Salmon from Cigna. I'm Dick Salmon. I'm a family physician and National Medical Director for Performance Measurement and Improvement for Signal Health. Hello, my name is Sue Williamson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Our agency administers our public health insurance programs like Medicaid and our S-CHIP program. I'm David Doerr, a practicing internist and medical informatician at Oregon Health and Science University. I will explain that. Mm -hmm. uh, who work, I work on a model called Care Management Plus. Uh, I'm Alan Dobson. I'm a, a family physician and uh, with Carolina's Healthcare System now. Uh, I'm the chair of Community Care of North Carolina and formerly the Medicaid Director and Assistant Secretary of Health. And my name is Bob Kocher. I work with the National Economic Council where I work on healthcare and I'm an internist by background as well. I want to thank everybody for coming. We are, uh, we are thrilled to have, uh, I think, a, a tremendous cross-section of innovative practices and experts to speak about primary care. I wanted to take a few minutes and talk to you a bit about um, the opportunity to, to uh, advance primary care and frame the discussion that we'll have shortly. And so, Dan, if you, if you don't mind, since we'll cut the slides, if you would just go ahead to the uh, next slide. So as Nancy Ann said, uh, we are thrilled that, that this year we will be tackling health care reform in ways that reduces the cost and cost growth for Americans and, and their families and businesses, that improves the quality of care, and expands access and choice to, to millions of people. Today's discussion is going to be all about improving the quality of care. Around the table, we have folks who have uh, done amazing things to improve the way patients receive care, and reform is going, only, only going to accelerate the improvement in care. I want to talk a bit about the, the changes in quality that, that we foresee coming, which many of you embody in the delivery system. The first is we're going to incentivize quality. And I think a theme that we're going to hear today is all about rewarding quality of care and thinking about ways we can align all the incentives such the practices organized in ways like you have. We're going to make sure the preventative care is not, um, not done because of cost. We're going to make sure that health plans cover that and make that accessible to everybody because that actually reduces costs and improves quality, and it's the right thing to do for sure. Coordination is going to be something that, I, that all of you have thought a lot about, and we're going to think a lot more about as a system on how to coordinate care such that patients with multiple diseases actually get the right care for their combination of diseases and for each disease, and that the care team, which is a team, knows, which, knows who's in charge and, and who's doing what and what needs to happen, and, and informatics is clearly part of that, but there's a lot that goes into that, and that, that has to be improved. Clinical rec uh, making sure that patients get the right clinically recommended evidence-based treatments. Too often, we fall short on delivering evidence-based care. There's lots of reasons why that may happen, but your practices that we're going to hear about have all come up with ways to ensure that evidence-based care is delivered more often to patients and figures out when it's not happening how to remedy that to get patients back on the right treatments. Duplicative testing is something that is chronic in our condition, in our, in our uh, health care system, and you've all thought through ways to organize the care such that there's less du uh, duplication and, and even things that are unnecessary that those are not done. And finally, the connection to the community. We have a system of clumsy hands -off, ha uh, handoffs between hospitals, specialists, primary care practices, community resources that leads to a lot of frustration for families and patients, clearly suboptimal outcomes. It's costly. And again, today we're going to talk about ways to ins ensure that the community and families and patients 
are much more likely to be informed and cooperative, cooperative in the care. And finally, reform will expand access to many millions of people who don't have access today. We talk about primary care today because primary <coughs> care is something that too often isn't in place for, for, for enough patients. And primary care, what, what we refer to when we say primary care, what we mean is a doctor and a practice and, and hopefully a care team who is responsible for ensuring that a patient working with them gets the, the proper care, that a patient knows who to call, that they call them back, that if you have questions, you have somebody who can answer, if you have concerns about accessing specialists or, or what to do, that there's a practice that actually serves those needs for you. And, and many of us in the room experience that. Most of you deliver those types of care to, to your patients. But it, it's too often not the case. And so in the care system of the future, we will absolutely have a much more robust primary care system that will be more like what we talked about today. Next, I, I want to point out that around the table is incredible impact. So we have seven systems who have all taken primary care advanced it in different ways, but all with similarly impressive results. And so we're going to hear stories today about how North Carolina has saved over $400 million already, taking better care of Medicaid patients. Winter Mountain saving a tremendous amount per patient per year across a, a really uh, a set of patients who are different and, and complicated in different ways than the Medicaid population that Alan's going to talk about. How Colorado has really improved uh, pediatric care and, and had remarkable improvement in compliance with evidence based metrics. How group health has um, very quickly avoided a lot of emergency room visits that, that would have led to. Um, both suboptimal outcomes and, and frustration, expense, and, and fear for families, and how Geisinger has driven down readmissions uh, to levels that many thought were impossible and have sustained it. So we have, I think, some really compelling stories today. And what's amazing about these stories, as we've talked with these groups and learn more about them, is that it's things that, that can be done widely in many places. So this is not, these are not limited examples. These are examples that all could be scaled. And so today's discussion, we'll talk some about how we can actually scale these so that more patients get more of the benefits that we're going to hear about today. As we go through, next slide, Dan. Um, there's going to be four elements. So I said there, there's many differences. There's four things that are common to all of these practices. The first is this notion of care coordination. So it's not left to chance what happens after a patient sees a doctor or a nurse or a practice. Rather, there's a follow-up process to ensure that whatever is supposed to happen happens, the patients are reminded, that physicians are reminded, it involves not just information technology, but teams that take care of patients because th there's no one person that's in charge. Rather, there's jobs that, that need to be done by, by a full team. There's a much more patient engagement in these practices than in a typical practice. So patients know what to do. There's follow-ups and, and incentives in some cases so that patients are rewarded for doing the right thing. But there's much more education that goes into the care of patients in these practices than in many around the country easier access. So in these practices, when you call them, they answer. And you're likely to actually get your phone call answered on the first phone call. That's not typical in many practices. And so they've come up with ways to make it much easier to actually interact. In some cases, the practices are open nights and weekends. There's, there's alternatives to emergency rooms. And it's much, much simpler to communicate, sometimes by email and other ways to make it easy for patients. And then finally, data driven. So each of these practices utilize health information technology to ensure that the practices are reminded which patients are at high risk so that interventions can be taken before the patient has complications. They're reminded which patients need age-appropriate screening so that if the appointment's not scheduled, it's scheduled and it happens. And so we're going to hear a lot about how information technology makes care better. And so I'm thrilled that we're going to get these stories and, and that there's similarities, but there's also tailoring that's happened to each of these practices such that it meets the needs of their patients. Um, Alan's going to go first. Um, in the interest of having a, a spirited roundtable discussion, we're going to try to be disciplined about five minutes. And Elizabeth's going to hold up a sign that says, one minute warning. And, we're gonna, and, we're, and, and I have to cut you off if you go over, which makes me very, very anxious. So I'm hoping that, that we will stick to that, because I think the discussion you all know about your practices, I think, more than, than many others. So we don't need to go into tons of detail, but we want to make sure you talk about what you did and what's happened. And all of you have data to share in that regard. So with that, I'm going to have Alan lead off, and we're going to hold questions till the end, and then we can use the roundtable for the questions. So, Well, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, talk about community care in North Carolina as we work on reforming our health care system. Uh, clearly, it's now time for reform, and, and, and we really must, to be economically um, sustainable, we have to overhaul the current fragmented system. And, and 
I think the foundation of any reform effort first must be an investment in primary care. Um, and I think the, the values and principles outlined in the joint principles of patient-centered primary care uh, is, uh, outlines is, is pretty, a pretty good first and fa fundamental step for reform. Community care is um, an example of the value of just such an investment. And we've started about 10 years ago with this project. Uh, community care is a public-private partnership with, between the state of North Carolina and 14 not-for-profit networks that are comprised of mo the majority of the local health care providers in the state. And it's built around primary care. Uh, it also includes all the, all the other physicians, local, local health care providers, and in particular our hospitals, our academic medical centers, our public hospital systems, health departments, social services, and other safety net organizations. This uh, partnership delivers uh, the patient-centered primary care to Medi you know, Medicaid and SCHIP recipients and other low-income adults and children in our state. Our networks have now grown to over 4,500 primary care physicians, the majority of primary care physicians in the state, in 1,360 locations covering all of North Carolina, all 100 counties, and manages a little over a million patients. And next slide. And this is what the map looks like uh, of how the providers have self-organized themselves. Uh, community care uh, delivers improved quality of care to our patients and cost savings to our state using three critical elements. First, primary care physicians serve as a medical home or uh, a personal physician for our patients. Second, local not-for-profit networks create are created to as a virtual integrated health system that links the primary care physicians and patients again, concentrate on the doctor-patient relationship to the rest of the local health care system and support agencies. It's, it's like the glue in, in the communities. These networks provide the needed physician le leadership and local collaboration in, in order to create a local solution to improve qu care management and quality. Health care is local. This provides a flexible structure that has been, proved to us to be adaptable in the rural areas as well as our largest areas, including our, uh, our largest academic health systems. Third, the state funds the primary care physicians through an additional blended monthly fee and also funds the network to provide additional local resources to the patients and the primary care doctors, such as case managers, care coordinators, pharmacists, medical directors, and some local quality improvement infrastructure to make sure that we improve the care. Uh, this assures that optimal supports provided the patients and, and the results are achieved locally. Uh, community care Next slide. Um, has uh, demonstrated quality improvement and cost savings and obviously uh, phenomenal growth since it's now statewide and has documented significant savings exceeding $100 million a year since 2003. And in short, North Carolina has been successfully in, in managing the cost of its Medicaid program mainly through a clinical management strategy rather than just a price reduction and regulatory control mechanism. So community care is now kind of the centerpiece healthcare strategy in North Carolina. It is enthusiastically accepted by both patients and providers. Again, it's a value-added proposition, and it's in the community. Our legislature has mandated its expansion to SCHIP and inclusion of mental health, and community <coughs> care is now working with CMS on a Medicare demo that will allow us to continue to care for the sickest Medicare, the duly eligible and at-risk Medicare. Next slide. Um, we believe um, North Carolina's community care model can serve some, is an important national model for health reform. Its local infrastructure will work both in urban and rural areas as well as public and private, uh, uh, public and private systems. Um, you know, the path for our reform efforts, I think, can be really informed by a lot of <coughs> folks around this table and our really high-functioning high health systems. Um, but the problem is that most of our uh, health care delivery system isn't in a system at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of the lessons learned from North Carolina uh, show the value of investing in patient-centered primary care and a roadmap for organizing local communities, regardless of size around quality and, and, and improvement of quality. So some of my suggestions for uh, improvement would be making sure we adequately re reimburse PCPs a blended payment to support those activities, um, making sure we have enough primary care doctors to meet the needs of our folks. Um, also aligning, you know, we were able to align some policy and payment decisions to get certain access 
and comprehensiveness um, equations like after hours clinics. Um, we need to fund additional care coordination strategies, both at the practice and community level, and, and provide the ability for uh, flexible ability for primary care physicians and other providers to link together outside of a, a risk model. The big thing we did learn was that you have to reinvest the savings to get growth and strengthen local systems and get meaningful and lasting growth. <clears throat> there's a need for preventive services and, and clearly the, there's a need to, for technical support for primary care physicians to undergo this transformation, maybe through an ag extension model or some model in the local community to, to support primary care efforts. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, participate in the discussion. Thanks. David? Great, thank you. Uh, as I said, I'm an internist and I, I uh, practice informatics as well. And one thing we do is study the well, way health information technology can really improve care. Um, but I like to do this in the context of a patient. And so I'm going to talk about our Care Management Plus pilot that was done at Intermountain Healthcare and then our subsequent dissemination at Oregon Health and Sciences in the context of Gloria. She's 75. She's actually seen at Intermountain. I'll show you her picture. Uh, with her remission in a little bit. She's active, she says she's, her health is fairly good, uh, she lives at home. Um, she's doing pretty well, but she has five chronic conditions. They've kind of accumulated diabetes, she had a little bit of depression, she has some cardiovascular disease, and she's having memory difficulties. And, and so we know just from that that her, she'll probably see on average 13 providers a year. She'll uh, fill 50 prescriptions. She has 90 times the risk of hospitalization versus somebody with no chronic conditions. And the 5% of Medicare patients like her account for about 42% of the costs. And so at Intermountain, where this was developed, these were the patients we really wanted to target in primary care to keep them healthy and at home. And so the model is simple. It's a care manager in a primary care team that has specific health information technology to help them. And we use that to help do care coordination, education, motivation, and other tasks. We've had seen some successes around hospitalizations, uh, reduced improvement in mortality, improvement in quality and efficiency. So, oh, go back. So a little bit about the background. We started doing this in 2001. Um, and in seven clinics versus six controls, um, we basically built this system with the help of the care managers. They saw of the about 70,000 patients in those clinics, the care managers saw about 4,700. And we compared these seven to six control clinics on cost, quality, and utilization. Our patient population was really focused on patients like Gloria, although they could refer whomever they wanted. And we've since, in, in the last few years, done dissemination in 75 teams at OHSU. Next slide. So the model is simple. Gloria would be referred by her primary care provider to the care manager. Actually, usually the care manager comes to the room um, and, and joins the visit. And then they work out uh, together what Gloria and her family need to stay healthy. And so the care managers receive specific training to do assessment and co-create a, a plan. And then they have technology to really back up that plan and make sure it happens reliably. And so the clinics were very similar to clinics. They, Intermountain's a large integrated delivery network. But they, they had multiple payers, and most of their pay did not come from a special pay for performance, a small proportion. And so the care coordinators did this because the primary care providers and the system thought it was a good idea for satisfaction overall. The care manager saw about 350 active patients on average in the pilot. And um, the health IT really helped them to do care coordination tracking, to never lose track of a population or a patient who's at risk, a person who's at risk. And it had a, a centralized reminder system that had protocols, but also had kind of the ongoing task around social and other needs that these patients so often face. So scheduling and access was improved, as well as uh, connection to the community through the IT. And the evaluations were, were regular in the program. The health plans, uh, initially it was done by the medical group, but since then we've worked with several health plans and different payment models, um, which I'll discuss at the end. And we've been working with federally qualified health centers in our dissemination as well as Medicaid. So what are the results? 
Um, I, I hit them at the beginning. I will discuss them. We reduce hospital admissions 20 to 40 percent, and we improve guideline compliance about the same. Uh, we reduce mortality. So the patients in these intervention clinics were living longer. People with multiple <coughs> chronic conditions are at high risk of an exacerbation of their illness that could lead to death. And all of this led to significant savings, which led Intermountain to double the size of the program in the medical group. And per patient, what we saw about $640 to $1,650 per patient per year in savings. We also saw the clinics were more efficient and people were much happier. The patients and their families called this a lifesaver. They really felt like they couldn't live without it. Um, and the physicians really felt that they could work smarter and, and the pressure on their primary care was uh, their tread, the, the hamster treadmill that many primary care physicians feel they're on with 20 to 30 visits a day was, was lessened. The care managers even told us that computer tools were an absolute godsend, which is obviously near to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we really felt like that was successful. And what we've done since then is rolled this out starting at OHSU at more than 75 clinics across the country. And a lot of what I'm going to say for the summary is really going to be focused on what those clinics told us. So next slide. First of all, we found that the care manager role was essential. Most of our dissemination clinics had a nurse but didn't have a care manager. We found nurses and social workers were great uh, at this, although some small <coughs> clinics really needed a combination, a team uh, that did the care management together. Training was essential. It was a new role for many of our care managers and care coordinators, and we really had these competencies we worked on. Health information uh, technology was essential. Every one of our initial practices and most of our dissemination had an electronic health record system, but they needed more. And so we, uh, we helped them to enhance what they had, to use it better, but also to use additional uh, functions around population <coughs> management and care planning. We found that our technical assistance was really helpful to them and was critical for them to be successful, but they could do it. And we found that most of them came back to us very excited about it, but since they were paying for this mostly themselves, really were talking to, to sustain this, they needed changes in the payment uh, that they got. We call this pay for proactive care, for care coordination, for goal setting and motivational interviewing, for behavioral change and education. Um, many of them also find that you know, per member per month is helpful, although selecting populations is is, is really helpful to see some cost savings that the clinics really needed to be able to see, uh, to refer whoever they could, uh, who's, that they saw the need for into the program to make it work, to make that efficiency work. So that's really what I had to say. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. <clears throat> Sue, take us to Colorado. Thank you. It's my pleasure to talk about the Medicaid Medical Homes for Children pilot that we initiated a couple of years ago, and I'd like to share some brief background to put it into context. When Governor Bill Ritter came into office in 2007, health care was a top priority of his administration. And there was really a deliberate decision <clears throat> to focus on children's coverage and health access issues. And while we have a couple of mani excellent managed care plans that participate in the Medicaid program, the vast majority of our Medicaid clients, children, are seen in a fee-for-service model. And for us, that raised some serious concerns or questions about uh, the sustainability and the increased cost associated with, um, with that fee-for-service model. It also raised some questions about the extent to which children were receiving preventive care, getting their immunizations, having care coordination. And it raised serious questions about access. At that time, we only 20% of our private pediatricians and family practice physicians participated in the Medicaid program. And of course, you know, uh, at the top of the list for not participating is the lack of reimbursement. But when you really dig down a little deeper, there are a variety of barriers that primary care physicians list as barriers to taking Medicaid and SCHIP kits. Uh, for example, there is a very high incidence of missed appointments. 
And we know why there are missed appointments, because this population sometimes ha have challenges accessing transportation to get to medical uh, appointments. <clears throat> we know that there are uh, social supports that are needed to support these families that uh, there are a lot of things that need to happen in that family's life other than just accessing health care. There are housing issues and uh, economic job-related issues. And so, um, so we had all of these concerns. And also in 2007, uh, legislation was passed, Medical Home for Children's leg legislation that mandated the department implement systems and standards for medical homes for children so that to maximize the number of children that had medical homes. Uh, and that was all supposed to be done in 12 months. So in government, that's a very short period of time to implement something. And so we had to work quickly and we had to work smart. And our approach was really to leverage the existing programs, resources that were already in place to create our pilot program. Fortunately for us, uh, we were well positioned to do this. Our sister agency, the Department of Public Health and Environment, their Title V program had invo been involved with Dr. Carl Cooley's um, learning labs and uh, learning about medical homes. And uh, out of that work, two passionate pediatricians, Dr. Steve Poole and Dr. James Todd, created a nonprofit association called the Colorado Children's Health Access Plan, which was really uh, designed to recruit more private primary care physicians to accept Medicaid and CHIP, and then to provide support services for those practices. And we also have a very robust uh, EPSDT outreach and case management program. We have outreach workers situated throughout the state that have been helping families uh, value and use health care, and they really serve as that health in that health educator role. So uh, we liken this to creating a Reese's peanut butter cup. We took all of the uh, as the best aspects of what we were doing in the public sector and join them with what the good work that was d being done in the private s sector and created our medical home pilot. Our pilot design, we had 28 CCHAP practices that uh, included about 11,000 Medicaid children. Uh, CCHAP, the nonprofit association, provided 14 support services to the families and practices. And then the, the department, we reimbursed a fee to the CCHAP practices and we aligned the payments in, uh, to preventive care. So we try to incentivize behavior. So our uh, incentive payments were we gave $10 per preventive care visit, birth to four years old, and uh, from five years to 19 years, $40 per preventive care visit. And we use existing EPSCT codes to provide that enhanced reimbursement. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of um, money, but uh, it was enough money to get us uh, going and in the right direction. Here you can see uh, our EPSDT outreach. They are really ser serving as that, uh, that care coordinator role. They are sort of, uh, again, approaching it from the holistic viewpoint of the, cl of the client, looking at the life cycle of the client, everything that has to happen in order for a family to uh, access health care services. They work in the community, identify resources, and link, the, link those families to those community resources. Because this pilot is focused on children, Colorado has a very unique sort of philosophy. We are very much family-centered. I know there's a lot of talk about patient-centered, but when you're working with children, you really have to look at the whole family. And so we have a very, we have a family-centered medical home model. And then our CCHAP, uh, um, physicians serve in the primary role of providing care and helping um, 
do the care coordination. The CCHAP continues to provide the support services, uh, interpretation services, linkages to mental health services, again, looking at the whole uh, child. Next, please. So what are the results of our pilot? Uh, as mentioned earlier, 74% of our Medicaid children in this pilot had a well-child visit during the 12-month observation period compared to 56%. Uh, we saw reduced costs of care per child, improved health outcomes, uh, increased immuniz immunization rates. In 2006, Colorado was ranked 49th in the rate of childhood immunizations for our Medicaid kids. We have raised that, we're 26th now in just a very short period of time. And we believe our medical home pilot and our work in this area has been a big contributing factor. Uh, preventive care visits increased as previously mentioned. Emergency care visits and hospitalization rates uh, have also decreased. Now, it says there on the slide that we are collecting baseline data, but miraculously, over the weekend, I was <laughs> able to obtain some, uh, some uh, data on the physician and client experience. CCHAP surveys the providers participating, 90% satisfaction rate. And uh, I think it's significant. My favorite story about a private practice is that Dr. Poole went to a uh, high-end pediatric private practice, never took Medicaid or S-CHIP kids. He led one of the physicians to the window and said, Did, look out that window. Did you know that 33% of the children that live in this neighborhood are eligible for Medicaid and S-CHIP, and you don't see a single one of those kids? That exchange, that dialogue, that communication was a turning point. I don't know if it was guilt. Sometimes guilt works very well. And, but uh, that pediatric practice started taking Medicaid patients. And um, again, I think physicians say they're willing to see uh, our kids. They just need some help with some of the barriers in uh, working with vulnerable populations. The family experience, uh, one parent quoted, the medical home is building relationships. 96% of our families feel their child's provider creates a medical home for their child. 100% feel the provider values the child and the child's family. And 100% uh, feel the provider meets the needs, family's cultural differences. Sue, so, so why don't we move to Cigna, and you can chime in in the conversation. Did about I go the, over? I tried so Your enthusiasm hard. is unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the satisfaction results came in at the last minute. We had to hear them. Um, you, you have a couple of good thoughts for how to scale it. Maybe you'll bring this into the conversation. I want to make sure everybody gets time and we have some discussion. So Barbara and Richard, if you could talk to us about what you're launching up at Dartmouth. Sure, uh, I'll go ahead and start. I'm Dick Salmon with Cigna Healthcare, and I'm joined by Barbara Walters from the Dartmouth Hitchcock System. And we're pleased to share with you uh, the, uh, the uh, partnership that we have developed over the last several years uh, that really resulted from a challenge our senior leadership gave to us 18 months ago to accelerate the improvement in both quality and affordability of the individuals that we served in common. Um, next slide, please. Uh, at baseline, uh, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock, as, almost, as all of you know, has a superb clinical uh, reputation, over a thousand physicians who provide excellent care in both urban, rural, and academic settings. In parallel to that, we have Cigna Healthcare, who over recent years has developed robust health advocacy services, both telephonic and internet-based case management, disease management and wellness services, as well as pretty significant health informatics uh, services to, with predictive models and other um, information to guide the improvement in care. The problem was, we had two problems. The problem was, first of all, these clinical efforts were not ideally connected. It's like two systems running in parallel, and we weren't getting the synergy that we wanted to get out of connecting those two uh, systems. The second was, that our primary interaction, to exaggerate the point, was a periodic negotiation over fee schedules every couple of years. 
And it was not an interaction where we sat down together and said, how do we improve the fundamental value? How do we improve both quality and affordability? And how does the plan reward Dartmouth for doing that? So we developed a, uh, a new program together that has the key concepts outlined there. And I want to emphasize just a few of them. Uh, one is we, we said that the program had to operate in the open fee-for-service environment. That is, this had to be a program that didn't require people to work through their primary care physician, but rather provided incentives to members to work with their primary care physicians because the physicians offered enhanced access and enhanced care coordination. So it was improving the care coordination delivered by primary care physicians, not by forcing people to work with the primary care physicians, but by providing such excellent service that that's what people wanted to do. Um, the second is the rewards for the program had to be based on an improvement of both quality and affordability. It wasn't just about quality, and it certainly wasn't just about affordability. Both had to improve in order to provide rewards, and we need to administer those rewards through a different payment mechanism. Instead of just increasing the fee-for-service payment, pay the rewards through a periodic care management payment. Um, the third was we wanted to obtain synergy. So leverage the strength of Dartmouth's direct face-to-face -face clinical programs with uh, Cigna's um, uh, uh, telephonic and internet-based programs and with Cigna's advanced analytic and health information services to identify patients who are at risk and identify gaps in care or care improvement opportunities. So with those three fundamental concepts, we began uh, designing our program in January of 08. We implemented it about a year ago, and we'll have our first level of results uh, later on this fall in about November. Next slide, please. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is to turn it over to Barbara, who will tell you about the real important aspects of the program, and that is how it affects individual patients. Thanks, Dick. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Dartmouth-Hitchcock participated in the Medicare Physician Group Practice Demonstration, de demonstration Project, and we were able to show increased um, quality compared to benchmark and national targets, as well as savings throughout our three years of participation in the program. And we were absolutely delighted and looking for a commercial partner to see if the same things that we had designed that are listed up there under practice resources would be applicable to a commercial population, because it really is a different patient population. So I'm just going to tell you a very brief story about one of our patients that I hope illustrates that we believe that we're on the right track here. So I want to talk about Mary. Uh, Mary is your next door neighbor, my next door neighbor, uh, could be my sister, could be any one of our sisters. She is married. She's been married for about 30 years. Her husband works. He's fully employed. He's um, insured by Cigna. He is a tradesman. Um, they have a couple kids. They have a couple grandkids. Mary loves to cook, and she really likes to scrapbook. Um, her husband is a hunter and a fisherman, lives in a small town in, in New Hampshire. Um, Mary has insulin-dependent diabetes, and she's a cancer survivor. She was referred to one of our care managers by one of her primary care docs, who she sees most often, because he just thought she was depressed and she wasn't getting better. No matter what he did, he really couldn't make her mood improve. Um, and our care manager was asked to do what care managers do, um, get to know her, and make a referral to a local mental health provider. Um, at the time that our care coordinator contacted Mary, and um, I think Dr. Kosher earlier said that you can call and get answered by the first time. We actually call our patients before they call us, which I think is really good sometimes. Um, and we do a screening tool for all of our patients in primary care, um, the personal health questionnaire nine, which is a score for depression. Her uh, score was 22, which is very, very severely depressed and, in fact, perhaps suicidal. Um, our care coordinator was able to at least connect with Mary, uh, began to speaking with her on the phone every week. They set small goals. Sometimes they met the goals. Sometimes they didn't meet the goals. She learned that Mary grew up in an orphanage. And throughout most of Mary's life, um, she was scared. She was shy. She felt invisible. Um, she was frightened to get involved with people. And she was the actual barrier to going to a mental health uh, visit, not her husband, as she had previously reported. 
And in fact, she started telling us that her husband was so worried about her, he began taking time off work to stay around the house with her so that she wouldn't do anything to harm herself. So we're also losing employed time from the employer's perspective here. Um, she said that when her husband wasn't in the house, the thing that kept her going was thinking about her grandkids. Um, in review, one of the things that our care managers do all the time, and I'm sure they do at all of the places that we're talking about, is medication reconciliation. So she would take the medication list that she thought that Mary was on and the medications that Mary thought she was on and try to make sure that they agreed on the same medication list. Um, and it just wasn't working. We've got this really spiffy electronic medical record. You can print out a patient-friendly medical um, medication list. We mailed it off to Mary because they weren't getting the words right. Um, called again, and uh, lo and behold, Mary uh, admitted that she really couldn't read very well. So she really didn't know what our spiffy, patient-friendly medical reconciliation list said. So our care manager scheduled a visit, brought her in. Um, her husband came in as well. And uh, God bless this woman. She sat down and color-coded and drew pictures on every single bottle of medication and on our spiffy medication list that the patient couldn't read. She put a frowny face for the antidepressant medication. She put a heart for her medication for her hypertension. Um, I think she did something with food for her cholesterol medication. And at the same time, um, we were interacting with Cigna, and Cigna shared with us that uh, Mary hadn't, in fact, filled her antidepressant medication in over a year. So it's really hard to get better from an antidepressant medication if you don't take it. Um, we got it all set. We involved the community. We involved her church. We involved the Visiting Nurses Association. Mary is taking all of her medications. Her husband hasn't missed a day at work in over, um, I think, about six months, the last time that we looked. Her score, um, her depression score, is down to nine, so she's, so she's in control. So I think that, that's, that's the core of what we're trying to do. We're trying to work with people living real lives, doing real things, fully employed, getting information from Cigna that they have that we don't have, getting information from our care manager. We have a doc who knew something wasn't right. We had a care manager who wouldn't give up. Um, and we had some information from Cigna that really helped us put this all together. And that's what we think that we're trying to do in this clinical collaboration. Um, and I'm going to skip my slides and close on that. I hope that we can spread this. And we do it in urban communities. We do it in small communities. We do it in large communities. And we think that this is what um, advanced primary care practice is all about. The docs love it. it takes off the burden of the paperwork. They get a patient who's ready to talk to them. The nurses love it. They're, be, they're being able to practice nursing the way they want to practice nursing and what they went to nursing school for. And patients are like, oh my gosh, you called me. I didn't even have to call you. So I think that's, that's what we're hoping for. Thank you. Bob, we had a slide that showed the payment algorithm. I don't know uh, that was before this one, but I guess it got, uh, actually got left out. Got so uh, <coughs> I can just, just speak one, one well, third. Well, but not that. But, uh, but Mary's story is one that was. Uh, I'm glad that you shared. Okay. I mean, okay. It's, uh, just how, how does it work? Okay. So again, to 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 make all of that work, we have to align the incentives. And so what we do together with Dartmouth is uh, agree that we will track both. Um, we will require both improvement in quality and improvement in affordability. And affordability is measured by total medical cost and the trend in total medical cost compared to the market average, so they're measured against their peers. The improvement in affordability essentially funds the bonus pool, and then how much of the bonus pool Dartmouth gets depends on how much they not only improve affordability, but also improve quality. And that payment is made through a periodic care management payment under the G-code system rather than as a modification for the fee for service. So we feel that by getting the reward system lined up, by getting synergy in the informatics, synergy in the, in the clinical uh, working together between Dartmouth and Cigna, that we're able to drive a much better uh, outcome. Great. Well, thank you. We're hearing some wonderful patient stories, and thanks for sharing Mary's. Uh, Michael, if you tell us what you're doing at Group Health, that would be great. Yes. Hello. I'm Dr. Michael Solman. I'm president of Group Health Physicians. Like all of you, we seek better care at lower cost. And we found at one year a 29% reduction in emergency room and urgent care visits, and our pilot paid for itself. 
Our practice has 900 physicians, 250 primary care practices, and cares for about 400,000 patients in the state of Washington. We have made a strategic long-term commitment to effective primary care to apply to all of our clinics. First, we ran a two-year pilot, and we learned from that pilot many things that helped us identify the elements to apply everywhere, which we're now about actually two-thirds of the way through using lean processes. In short, we learned that upfront investments in primary care lead to better quality, better patient and staff satisfaction, and stabilize the medical cost trend. So what this really is about, if I can have the next slide, is putting the patient-physician relationship at the core of all we do, and then supporting that relationship with high-quality information, strong teams, and great access. This allows the teams to address each patient's acute, chronic, and prevention needs. That's it in a nutshell. So what did we do? First, we invested in our primary care teams. We added 30% of staffing physicians, nurses, mid-levels, pharmacists. Then we decrease the number of patients that each physician is responsible for, from 2,300 to 1,800. Increase the visit time on a template from 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And then we hit on real gold. We fi finally figured out how to really leverage our electronic medical record, or EMR. And I have a key point about this, that it's not really about the convenience that these records allow for both patients and clinicians, though that convenience is huge and can't be overstated. The real power in these systems comes because they allow us to know our patients so that we can proactively address their care needs. That's what makes them really work. And we can address these care needs through a variety of processes, from focused outreach to complex patients to simply knowing every patient's prevention needs at every visit and delivering on them. This, of course, increases our quality scores, which is nice, but more importantly, it allows us to know what to do for each patient at every visit. We can also address populations of patients. Example, 2007, we put in a new process to care for our 7,000 patients on blood thinners. We shortly decreased clots and bleeds 26%, saving over $3 million while giving better care. Last point about EMRs. Clinicians throughout our system are adding to the evolving story about each patient. This kind of collaboration deepens our understanding and makes it pretty easy, actually, to give up-to-date, seamless, evidence-based care. About access, we changed the paradigm. We said, patients, you're in charge. You tell us what access works for you. Group visit, traditional face-to-face -face visit, email, secure message, phone visit, what works, you're in charge. We found that we could often resolve their concerns with a phone message or secure message, saving them time, cost, and convenience. Patients also can access their records, email their doctor, order medications, and make appointments online. This engages them in their health strengthens the bond between them and their doctor, and ultimately puts them right where they belong at the center of their care experience. The results of one year, if I can have the next slide, are gratifying. At two years, they're even better. I need to point out the error. The first line under cost productivity says we added 29%. That's wrong. We added nine or $10 million across our system for all of it, uh, which is about 8% in primary care. So, at one year, as I said, we, f we saw a 29%, that's where the number came from, reduction in ER visits and urgent care visits. We also saw an 11% reduction in ambulatory care sensitive hospital admissions, the kind that do well with good ambulatory care. The reduction in utilization actually paid for the pilot by one year. We didn't expect that. I had a briefing last week about the two year results and it's even more compelling and, and I can tell you this much, it saves money, lots of money. Also improves health outcomes, like cholesterol management in people with coronary artery disease or diabetes. And it enhanced work satisfaction, decreased burnout, increased patient satisfaction. We now have 12 applicants for every position we post in primary care. Think about that, given the primary care shortage nationally and in our state. So based on this findings, we're rolling it out to all 26 medical centers. We're about two-thirds of the way there. 
We identified the key ingredients for our system. We think these elements can be translated to different practices with different payment mechanisms and lesser levels of integration. And we believe some of these key elements need to be supported by reform. Example, we need innovative payment mechanisms that allow quality, integrated electronic medical records, more development of medical homes, collaboration between providers. That allows teams to care for the whole patient across the continuum of care, and that's how you get the benefits. Most important, of course, is the experience of the patient. So I want to close with the words of a delightful 80-year-old woman. Not only today, but continually, no matter when we come, we are treated promptly, courteously, cheerfully, and efficiently. In recent visits, we are aware of an extended time with the doctor, no longer a sense of rush. To everyone, from the front door to the end of our visit, thank you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Great story. Craig, talk to us about Vermont. Sure. First off, um, <clears throat> I want to thank Nancy and Bob. I want to thank you both for the opportunity to be here on, on behalf of the state of Vermont. Um, one of the things that drew me to Vermont two years ago was the environment there and the commitment, um, the willingness of the leadership in the state, the governor and the legislature, to really take on health care reform and do it in, a, in as comprehensive a way as you could imagine. And, and it's really visionary leadership, and I think that's where this starts, when you have, in our case, a bipartisan willingness to come together and to work on complete health care reform. And that's what's led us to where we are uh, as a state right now with our health care reform models. And I would just summarize it by saying what the state really wants to do is build this coordinated, well-integrated, high-quality system of health. And where are we starting from? We're starting from a typical tapestry like the rest of America with independent practices, some big, some small, some affiliated with hospitals, some federally qualified health centers, poor areas. Um, more dense in urban areas. We're starting with the same tapestry. How do you turn it into a coordinated system of health? So if we start off with the first slide, uh, it's a summary of the timeline. And uh, we're in the midst of our, our, our first pilot and uh, really working on testing this out across this mosaic, uh, this healthcare environment that we have. We're working on three different communities. We hope to have about 60,000 total patients uh, enrolled in the pilots testing this new approach to health care. You can see the timeline on the bottom of the slide. We started planning this in 2007, and that meant negotiating the financial reform, designing a payment model that could really support high quality care. It meant designing the health information technology that would be, that would be so critical for this. It meant putting in place the community health teams. And so we spent about a year getting the design, the strategies up, and then in uh, July of last year, we started with the first pilot community, October the 2nd, and we're now getting ready to gear up the third pilot community. Um, just as a brief summary of this, the uptake has been um, tremendous, as we've heard from the other participants, with the docs, with the patients, with the families, and even with some surprising, the hospital CEOs, the, the uptake of this and the engagement of this, the acceptance of this has been um, fairly rapid, and so much so that we're actually this year, this starting this summer, working on statewide readiness for expansion of the model, much faster than, than we would have anticipated. So if I go to the next slide, I can just give you a key breakdown on what the components of the, of the healthcare model is. Um, it really does focus on building primary care into being able to operate with just high quality delivery. And so it starts with the payment reform. And the payment reform that we've negotiated is with all of our insurers involved. And I want to stress that. It's really critical to have all the insurers involved in this. So our major commercial insurers and Medicaid, they're all paying the same one. And what happens is the practices get scored based on national standards, our NCQA standards. This drives, based on the quality of care, how, how thorough the care is, the great access, the practices get an enhanced payment. Now, it's on top of their normal fee for service. So what are we doing here? We're beginning to balance out the pressures, the incentives for volume against incentives for quality, beginning to balance out that scale where it was all volume before. But that part of the payment isn't all it's limited to. It, it, it also includes our insurers sharing the cost for what we call community health teams. And these teams are a critical component. 
So the teams are uh, made up of a whole mix of, of, of professionals. They include nurse coordinators, social workers, mental health counselors, dietitians, the people you really need to make thorough, highly high quality health care work. Now the idea of this, the idea of having all our insurers involved and the idea of having a health team not limited to a practice is, how do you scale this? How do you work in a world where you have a small independent single practitioner versus large group practices? Where you have some practices that are spread out in rural areas, others that are in more dense urban areas. How do you build a model that can work across this whole setting? So that's the idea of the community health teams and of having the insurers share the cost, that these teams can be expanded, scaled, include the number of people, the right mix of people that they need to serve a, a collection of, of primary care practices, not just one. And then the primary care practices are paid for delivering thorough care. And what we've seen emerge out of this is an incredible approach to well-coordinated care. Because we start with a team of five people on the community health team. But that's the new people that are put in place. What happens is they do such an effective job of linking to social services and other services in the community that the functional team is much bigger than the five. And we're seeing it translate into tremendous case examples. And I was listening, just thinking of one I asked some of our docs to, for case examples today. And uh, one classic example, very similar to what you described, is a 62-year-old woman living in a poorer area in, in Vermont, lower socioeconomic area, came in to see her primary care doctor maybe once every two years. She's got diabetes. Came in last spring. Turned out she had an elevated depression uh, score, never really engaged in her treatment plan or getting control of her disease. Uh, turned out that she was more worried about the rest of the people in her house being able to get their health care. The doc was able to attach her to the community health team, the nurse coordinator, the mental health counselor. They began to work with her, connected her to social services that got her transportation to the practices. In July, just a few months later, she now has really solid control of her diabetes. She's had tremendous improvement in the mental health issues. And this is a classic example of a patient that was going to be ripe for the worst possible health outcomes, a chronic disease with depression. She was going to be sick. She was going to have terrible outcomes. She was going to cost the health system a large amount of money in terms of hospitalizations. And within a few months, this <coughs> team working with the primary care doctor was able to turn that around. And those type of experiences have really um, led to, to rapid uptake and adoption of the model in the state and the, and the desire to expand this statewide. Um, the health IT is part of this, the information technology. It's a core part of this, but it should live quietly behind the scenes, helping deliver, helping <coughs> drive great care. It, it shouldn't be the focus of it. It should be the architecture that supports it. And so we have electronic medical records where they have them connected through to registries with the health information exchange so information can pass back and forth. And the core information is where it needs to be for the community health team members and for the, uh, the practices and the people working within the practices. Um, I just on the model want to emphasize two things. Not only do we have the healthcare delivery people on our community health teams, but we've included public health specialists. So the Department of Health has prevention specialists as part of the team. And for um, the first time in my personal experience, what we're beginning to put together is public health and health care delivery working closely together to, to really go after improving the health in communities. Through the health care delivery part of it, like we just talked about, but also through the public health aspects and healthier living workshops, self-management programs, improved messaging, getting the message out there about how to improve uh, your health and how to build an environment that can really support, support a healthy population. Um, lastly, on this slide on the model, our hospital CEOs have unanimously agreed to work with us, as I mentioned, for statewide readiness, and we're now building out the health information architecture and beginning care coordination for primary care practices. The goal is to have that in every hospital service area across the state, so should we be able to expand this model, they'll be able to, to do that quickly. If we move on to the, the next slide, thinking about Evaluation, we have a core set of measures to look at this in many ways, the way we've heard about with all the other programs, looking at the quality of health care. You improve the quality and you, you have this new environment with payment reform, with community health teams, with information technology. If you have this new environment, does it really change the way quality of care is delivered? And if it does, 
do patients get more of the screening tests and the assessments that they need? And if they get more of those assessments and more thorough care and they, and they, they stay engaged and come back for visits on a regular basis and get good follow-up and all the rest, does it really change the health of this population? Do they shift from the episodic care and the acute care to more preventive care? And lastly, if all that happens, what happens financially? What's the impact financially on health care costs in the state? And so we, um, to, to that extent, have uh, put in place a, a robust set of databases, and uh, we're going to look very carefully at all these different layers of evaluation. Um, the last thing that I just want to mention on the last slide, what do we really need for this to work? And what we need is to even have more complete participation of all our insurers. We really need Medicare participation as one of our insurers uh, working closely with us to expand this statewide. And with that, I want to thank you again for, for the opportunity. Thanks, Craig. Rick, talk to us about what Geisinger is doing. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Geisinger is an integrated system that includes a large group practice, two teaching hospitals, and an insurance company, Geisinger Health Plan. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we are not mutually exclusive. Our providers participate in other insurers' networks, and GHP uses other community providers. In 2006, we concluded that we needed to develop a new care model to provide higher value outcomes for our Medicare patients and members. Our objectives were to improve the quality, experience, and efficiency of care for that population. We also believed that healthcare financing was a zero-sum game. Higher costs today would lead to reduced coverage for patients. So we had to do this without increasing the total cost of care. The Proven Health Navigator model was the result of this effort. We introduced it to one pilot pra uh, practice in late 2006 and have rapidly expanded it so that this fall will be active in 35 practices, including four non-Geisinger-owned practices, covering about 70,000 patients. Next slide. The model was built as a partnership between our primary care physicians and our insurance company, GHP. The strategy was to provide 24-7, 360-degree care and guidance for our patients putting the patient, in our case it's Mrs. Jones here, at the center of our redesign efforts. We developed new care processes and systems that could deliver high value care whenever and wherever she needed it. As a result, our care team, which here includes the GHP case manager, follows and guides Mrs. Jones when she's at home, in the PCP office, in a specialist office, a nursing home, or a hospital. Next slide, please. A patient-centered primary care model similar to those described by others today was the foundation for this effort. We expanded access and enhanced the capabilities of the office team. Aides and nurses provide many routine services, often prompted by time of service reminders from our electronic health record registries and care guidelines. When Mrs. Jones is seen for a diabetes checkup, the nurse is reminded to order the appropriate lab work and to schedule her annual eye exam. When she's at home, our remote wireless scale sends direct her daily weights to our nurses so that they can monitor her heart failure status. We next moved our population management activities from the plan to the PCP practice. In-office case managers employed by GHP are staffed at a ratio of one to every 800 Medicare members. The care man managers use our predictive modeling tools to identify high-risk patients like Mrs. Jones. The case manager then meets with Mrs. Jones and her family to develop an individualized care plan. If she finds her condition worsening, she can call the case manager in the PCP office using a dedicated phone line to get immediate advice. If she's hospitalized, the case manager monitors her status in the hospital, calls her within 48 hours of her discharge, and arranges for her to be seen within seven days. The practice uh, then developed value care systems to, to improve the services provided outside the primary care practice. The office, or the goal is to identify and use specialists and ancillary providers were aligned with this value mission. The practices also designed their coverage systems for hospital and nursing home services to optimize care in those settings as well. Under our quality outcomes program, each practice pursues a set of 12, or rather 10, quality initiatives targeted on improving broad quality metrics. The teams meet monthly to review their progress on meeting these goals as well as goals related to the domains of the member experience and cost of care. During these meetings, they also discuss individual cases, trying, trying to identify opportunities to improve their care. 
Finally, the value reimbursement program we put in place added new stipends for the physicians in the practice, as well as a shared savings incentive model to our pre-existing fee-for-service and pay-for-performance programs. All incentive payments are based on meeting quality targets. And while these additional payments added costs, we believed that the improvements in the total cost of care would cover them. Next slide. We did find that uh, our effective care coordination focused on the most fragile high-risk patients demonstrated positive returns quickly. Our transitions of care program reduced readmissions for the population within three months. Case management reduced total admissions within uh, six months. Next slide, please. Results have been very positive for our first 11,000 members. And all these results are measured across the entire population. It is not a segment of high-risk patients. There's no regression to the mean uh, problem. And we believe that these results can be projected over our entire Medicare population. On health status, we saw significant improvement in our metrics for measuring uh, compliance with and intermediate outcomes for diabetes, coronary artery disease, as well as preventive care services. Readmissions decreased 25%, total admissions decreased 15%, and the total cost of medical care was 7% less than in our comparable Medicare population. Member satisfaction also improved on already high scores. The next slide. In conclusion, we've learned that it is possible to deliver more value for our members. The business case for the model is strong. There was a two to one return on investment, and the model has been rapidly scalable to practices of different sizes and types. We're currently in the process of designing and implementing a multi-payer uh, program in Northeast Pennsylvania. Care managers are central. They are both the resources for managing individual patients and act as the focus for our population management efforts within the practice. The partnership approach was important because it grew from the realization that neither the practice nor the health plan could do this alone. It needed to be a partnership. Both parties needed to bring strengths in order to be successful. We found that electronic health records were helpful, but not essential. We've used other plan HIT tools to help practices without them achieve similar results. I think the most essential aspect of the model is to establish a context that drives the practice to focus on delivering high value outcomes for individual patients and their populations. We've aligned the operations and finances of the PCP business model with delivering these outcomes. In short, we found that if we give doctors a reason to deliver and pursue value for their patients, and we support their practices with data and operational enhancements, the care teams will deliver it and deliver it in the short term. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Again, I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Well, <laughs> this has been fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, I, I should have said at the beginning that uh, what's great is that all of these uh, experiments, projects are well underway around the country and showing a lot of positive results. But also, um, there's already been some activity in Congress around trying to advance this effort, that building on the, the things that you've been doing. So in the Recovery Act, there was some funding for additional preventive health activities and, and chronic care management activities. And in addition, the House um, Health Reform Bill that uh, three committees have, um, have put forward does have um, funding for pilots around doing more of this around the country that will be informed by the things you all have done. So uh, it's not like we're just talking you know, in academic circles here, this is already happening, and Congress has taken note and is trying to move it forward. Do you have a, a mode for trying to get some discussion going before we have yeah, to? Yeah, Kavita, Nina, I think Great. you, you okay. have some thoughts. We don't have a lot of time. Time. <laughs> so do you want to just? Sure. Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll dive right in. I mean, based on what Nancy Ann was saying, I think one of the things that would be interesting for us to hear from you is with these great examples and models that we have, how do we take that to a larger scale, like to a national scale? What are the things that we need to consider? What are the ways in which we can go about doing it? So I should pick some. I, I could dive in and Christian Frankfurt. You now have at least 102 pilots that, that are rolling out across the country. You've heard from seven. And, and, and what we've seen is really anywhere from seven to 17 percent or seven um, per number per month savings. And it's, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, tremendous uh, stories, and but I was 
stress from the standpoint of the 600 members of the Pension Fund Fair Collaborative that we firmly agree on a set of principles that we give to you as a gift. We've got all of organized primary care that's signed on to those principles. Everybody around this table are doing the, the pilots following those principles. And, and it's more than just chronic care management, it's more than just care coordination, it's comprehensive primary care for all of our patients. That's got to be foundational for all of us, honest. There's no other civilized nation on the face of the earth that's delivered health care of value without that kind of a fundamental, foundational understanding of health care. We, we, my members, my patients want access, they want convenience, they want to be able to use tools like emails to communicate with their doctors and their doctors to be paid for that. That's fundamental and foundational. So I mean, the current bills that, that, that you talked about that are on the Hill, they're great, we support them, but they focus narrowly on stuff like end of life and chronic disease. And when you do that, you really miss the whole point of a system that's designed for everybody. Clearly great, comprehensive, primary care for everybody as foundational for our nation. Well, let's try to catch it around counterclockwise. Okay, uh, just a couple of thoughts pulling together um, some themes uh, from the discussions. What can we do to really move this forward? Um, first of all, the um, health IT. I think there's an opportunity uh, with the R measures of meaningful use um, and other uh, efforts underway currently at HHS uh, to really send in a signal to the um, EHR industry that there's some standardized ways that these systems need to support uh, the practices. Because right now, too many practices have to figure out on their own how to make the systems work for them to provide a medical home. So there's an opportunity uh, to make that easier for those uh, going forward. Um, secondly, the, the idea of the regional extension centers, which is really uh, Kevin's thing. Uh, but we've heard a lot from relatively big systems around the table, some from systems that have worked as well. And they really need um, what we call come to call extension centers uh, to support them. And then finally, um, interoperability. Um, again, it, you can achieve a lot of coordination of care within an integrated system, but it's really hard to achieve uh, right now uh, without the kind of interoperability where different systems can talk to each other. Ken? Um, I just first want to thank the presenters for providing the data. Um, it's important for people to understand that there's a lot more information out there other than the Medicare demonstrations. So I, if you haven't published the data, I would encourage you to get it out there and publish because this is a re real important body of work. I, I'm scaling and rep replicating, you know, I, I focus on the functions and I heard some real common themes across the uh, board here in terms of what are the key functions that really seem to be effective in driving these results. And one was integration of the care coordination with the physician practice. We've learned that from the from the Medicare demonstrations. We've also learned it from uh, uh, the work in North Carolina, Vermont, uh, Geisinger, and, and some of the other models as well. That's essential. Uh, second is building in a transitional care component. Uh, this is critical in the Medicare program. We've got 20% of patients readmitted within 30 days. We've heard results. We can reduce those by 25 to 50% if you have a, a program put in there that's targeting those. Targeting the right patients and, and me measuring progress on it. Uh, also important, I think we learned that from how not to do that in the Medicare demonstrations, and we've seen the value of how to do it in these programs. Uh, the fourth piece would be a population based primary prevention, disease aversion. Uh, we talk a lot about prevention in terms of detecting disease, well, that's important, but averting disease in the first place. Uh, is as important, and we have some proven results of how to do that, and I think that's in a population-based way got to be a core part of, of what we do here. Uh, the role of data and measurement and evaluation, having that feedback component about how well we're doing uh, in providing that information organically to the systems, uh, I think is critical as well. And I guess the final point I'd make is uh, payment reforms. Uh, I guess I'm thinking more specifically about fee-for-service Medicare, but making sure that you align financial incentives and payment incentives with some of these structural changes, uh, I think, is an important part. So I, I would target those functionalities, because if you target the functions, we can scale this. We've seen it in Vermont, and we've seen this in, in North Carolina. Uh, I think it's the direction to go. The, the current congressional bills are on the right, right path. I guess the, uh, the issue is, uh, can, can we improve on those? Can we keep pushing? I hope so. I guess I'd make the final point is that 
certainly what they put in those bills is, is better than what we're doing now. So we're, we're going in the right direction. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned here about how to improve uh, what we're doing in this uh, current discussion. Bob and then Dan. Well, I, I really appreciate Ken's going before me because he saved half my talk. <laughs> yeah. Good, we'll keep doing that. No, so it so allows me to say something else. What Ken is pointing out is very important that all of these groups have very common functionalities, very common vision, very common goals, and have gotten there with some variation that I think actually they could learn from each other. That, that's fantastic. That, that says that you have a model that, that's scalable, a, a model that's implementable. Where I wanted to talk to was uh, I'm, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has asked us to do an evaluation of a, a primary care standalone network in Texas that took 15 years to get there. And that really is the variation in scalability. That without payment reform, without <laughs> facilitation, without leadership and vision and getting there, without getting all the payers involved, this goes from a two-year process, as we've seen in some states, to a 15-year process. So it really takes some organization and some work to help practices get there, particularly, as Craig was saying, in, in areas where you have ones or twos or three-person practices, or like Phyllis was saying, you really need to facilitate those people getting there. And you need to, to help get the payment reform, the community care teams, the public health integration set up for them and get them involved in the process. That will take you from a two-year to a 15-year process, or 15 to two-year, depending on how you set it up. Great, thank you. Daniel. Yeah. I, I, I have five really quick thoughts. One is education, communication of what this is and what it's not. And I think that the American public would just be really excited to hear about what this is versus what it's not. So I think, one, communication, these types of sessions, and taking this out on a broader platform would be certainly helpful. Uh, common theme, leadership. Bring all the governors together. Uh, share these stories. And, and you hear a common theme about leadership. We get a chance to spend a lot of time with the state leaders. And the governors are looking for ideas like this that can start to get at cost and quality. And uh, I think they would be very receptive to you sponsoring something to bring in these kind of ideas. Uh, third area, incentives. You need to bring the health plans in this conversation. It's great to have Cigna as part of this conversation. The health plans can play a very important role in creating the right kind of incentive systems, uh, independent of the change in the ruck and some of the other things that are going on. So bring them in. They're, they want to come, bring them into this conversation. I think it's a very healthy one. Primary care education. We, we need to have a resurgence of primary care physicians. We need to look at the team care models. You heard about care management. Start calling that out. Start encouraging people to build new medical schools that have primary care as a foundation, uh, new care management. I think that would be very helpful. Again, your voice heard there would go a long way. And last but not least, I think encourage this level of incubation. Find a way to continue to fund these kind of projects, whether it's any type of rapid learning networks included within primary care, whatever it might be. Any monies that you have to continue to drive this, we can shorten that time from 15 years to two years based on the experience that helps. So those are the five things, communication, leadership, uh, incentives, primary care education, and then continue to find a way to fund these kind of projects that are making a difference. I'm going to be hard about comments, so maybe just John and then Chris. Okay, all right, two more. Um, well, again, congratulations, uh, and I think it's remarkable how the functions around primary care have all been satisfied in each of these um, a, a projects of first contact, continuous, comprehensive, and coordinated care, but also that, that everybody has, has held on to the key elements of the Wagner chronic care model of data, as Ken mentioned, and, the, and a management information management systems a shared decision making and patient self-management. Those are all key elements that everybody has. What I think we may need to, to think about now more is think about this more from a patient's point of view. It's one thing to have a patient experience through an integrated health system. It's another thing to have a patient experience through a series of silos in a community where the patient has to go from the practice to the hospital to wherever now. So um, I'm very interested that, that from the point of view of state-based initiatives, such as Alan and Craig mentioned, um, and Susan, uh, compared to the integrated health systems, uh, how we can turn this around and think 
that from a patient's point of view as they navigate their way through the healthcare system, that they will expect and get the same quality of care and cost reductions across a, a community of care as opposed to each individual silo of healthcare. Okay, thanks so much. I just wanted to say um, very briefly, I think one of our goals is better coordinated care. It's also that we not have the uninsured in this country. And as you're looking at primary care, I'd urge you to look at the system that they have in Richmond, Virginia with the VCU system, coordinated care for the uninsured, that give all of them a medical home, give them a primary care network. And these are all people who do not have access to health insurance today. And I think you need to look. I know they're doing some of that in North Carolina also. I think there's a couple of very good models out there for the uninsured right now. And Kevin's the only one who did not get to. Unusually uh, quiet. I know. I, know. <laughs> I think I shocked you. That's why you said, what's going on? It's usually not the case. You right? must not be feeling well. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, I agree with all the comments. And again, I appreciate everybody sharing their experiences. Look, folks. I think there's got to be a vision here, and I think partly this is in your, your sort of lap. I mean, we talked about this a little bit before, Bob. It is about a vision for what health care in this country should look like, and it's getting beyond that it's, that it's just about coverage. Absolutely, we need to cover everybody in this country, but that's just the first start of a transformation of what health care should be, and we're not doing a good enough job. It's for many people, even those who are insured, it's good, but it's not great, and it's not the level of superb care that everybody should be getting in this in this country, and you hear pockets of where that's happening, where any one of us would love to go to group health or to Geisinger and say, now that's the care. And we should be saying that's the care every American should be getting today, um, that they should be getting accessible, whole person, uh, patient-centered care that is built on a solid foundation of primary care. And you know that is not the governing ethos of this health care system right now. It's about how much high tech can you pour into it? How much subspecialization can you get? How many new hospitals can you build? And that's where every incentive is right now, from the Medicare program to the Medicaid program, uh, to the payment schedule, to the investment in medical education. So I think there's got to be ownership and a willingness to put a vision of saying that is actually not buying us high quality, patient centered, accountable, sustainable health care. We need a new vision and that the White House is willing to articulate a vision that is one that's really built around whole person, patient-centered care, and it's got to be built on a foundation of primary care. And the, the, the emergency in all this is the foundation is crumbling under our feet right now. We have half as many people going into family medicine, general internal medicine, as there were a decade ago. It's happening with physician assistants. Uh, you know, every model you've heard of is built on a foundation, not just of physicians, but a, but a core of primary care clinicians with other team members. And if we don't reverse that trajectory right away, we will not have the capacity nationwide to, to achieve this vision. So I think I, I'd like to hear that articulated. I, like, I think the public would get that, that this is why every American has a stake in health care reform, because it's a better type of care they will be getting that works for them. And I think we really need to look across the board at what we're going to do to rebuild that primary care foundation that undergirds this entire system. That summed it That's up a well. a good conclusion. <laughs> yeah. And I think you have heard that vision here today, um, Kevin. Yeah. In, in yeah. manifest in what's going on around the country. And yeah. I guess I'm a glass half full person because I, I, I yeah, no, was um, <laughs> thrilled to see that there was as much um, dissemination of this model as there is. I mean, yeah. I didn't realize, for example, that, that group health was doing it in as many places and that you know, others are doing the same thing. I knew you know, Geisinger in one location. I didn't realize you were spreading it out so much. I've been to Vermont and had talked to Governor Douglas, who is a great uh, <coughs> sort of spokesperson for the cause, and, and I think he does talk to other governors about it as well. So I think that uh, that is what we're aspiring to here, and with the work of everybody in this room, we can make it, make it a reality. Well, I'm half full, too, and I think there is, I agree with you, there are really good elements in the bills moving forward, and I think they need to, we need to assure that they stay there and are strengthened. We do. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.